Hello, uh, and welcome to KCP Community Meeting, October 5th, 2021. Um, the agenda is up here. David had some items uh, already on the agenda, and I will uh, I will add some while he's talking uh, to talk about after. David, take it away. Um, hello. Um, so maybe, yeah, it's mainly about two points. The first one is the status of the KCP Ingress work. So in this regard, I would probably let just Joachim said uh, um, some words because we, we mainly work together on this. <laughs> uh, thank you, David. So um, basically, we've been trying to join the KCP Ingress controller with uh, the Dev Workspaces controller. So also, we have been preparing the KCP Ingress to work uh, locally for the demos we're planning to do. So basically, the current status is it's still using the splitter pattern. So we are still creating a secondary object based on the root ingress object. Uh, we will discuss this later as it introduces some issues, some challenges about who owns what and the concept of ownership. Um, right now, as we need it for local development and local demos, uh, we included like an Envoy XDS server. So it's like a, it, it can configure an Envoy instance that runs locally in your laptop and it will parse a small subset of the functionality of an uh, B1 ingress of the spec and it will configure that Envoy. So it's, it's useful for local development because if not, we will need to rely on DNS and, you know, uh, getting DNS to work locally and with everything can be a little bit messy. And well, basically, um, that's the current state. Honestly, it's kind of working. You will see now in the movie. But then there is some next steps that I'm starting to take a look at, which is uh, integrating with external DLS, DNS uh, controller for more um, a cloud uh, approach, you know, to deploy that in AWS and get Route 53 to work with uh, KCP Ingress. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, proper testing and improve the code and everything, you know, that we should be doing always. Uh, thank you very much, Joachim. Um, so there is a demo, in fact, um, uh, I posted the link also here in, in the issue, a demo about dev workspace on top of KCP um, with the KCP ingress controller. So the main difference, I don't know where well, it's 10 minutes because I just recorded that also for anyone with, who did not see the first demo uh, to, to be able to understand. So I don't know, maybe we don't want to, to read that fully here. I don't know, or we have time. But anyway, uh, the result of this is really that we have a single a URL to access the workspace, dev workspaces, uh, pods from either uh, whatever be the physical cluster it's living on. So the demo mainly shows um, um, you switching the workspace from one physical cluster to the other just by, you know, changing the, the label, cluster label on the uh, mainly service um, deployment uh, and the other objects like config map or service account. And then all the objects by the, by the sinker, as we can expect, are automatically removed from uh, cluster west and created again on cluster east. And thanks to the KCP uh, ingress controller as well, uh, the um, ingresses follows this, uh, follow this move. And finally, the right ingress is created in the cluster east instead of west and and also linked to the envoy proxy so that everything is transparent so mainly you you just have let's say 20 seconds uh, your uh, chair workspace and available and then after 20 seconds in the same uh, you're in the same you know uh, browser and your workspace is available again but just running on a distant cluster uh, so i mean nice. just just summarize like that I don't, I don't want to take too much time if we have some other topics here but anyone can have a look to the demo. I will probably post it as well um, on the channels and possibly also on the on the DevTools side uh, because I assume that might be interesting for them to have a, a quick insight on the fact that 
<laughs> still things um, go go continue and 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 things seems to be a bit more you know concrete now that you have a single URL to access your workspace uh, and being able to abstract the the relocation. Um, yeah, so twenty seconds is, is pretty amazing for. I mean, obviously, a twenty second outage is is uh, not something you would want. But if it means I don't care that the cluster behind here disappeared and moved over there, then that's pretty good. Yes. Well, I I mean, I said twenty second. I didn't really you know sure, sure, sure. measure the time, but it's quite you know just the time for the for the the the, the new deployment to start. Which is mainly, you know, pulling uh, some images that might, you know, oh, of course, depend on the, on the network. But on the KCP side, it's it's somehow, you know, uh, just immediate that. And David, things, right now, yes. right now we don't have the the lagging drain. Like we don't have the um, the equivalent yeah, exactly. of deployment, which does ramp before rundown. So. In theory, it would exactly. be zero when there's no state. Yes. And then when there's state, you're talking about exactly. the minimum time necessary to get the minimum PV and then have everything attach, uh, which exactly. of course is the K-native problem of um, you know, how long does it actually take to start a pod? Um, so we'd have to think <laughs> through that. Yeah. But but I was about to say, to say yes, that it, of course it doesn't take into account any uh, process for first starting the second one before stopping the first one uh, which is what we would do in in real life like now it's just you know switching uh, forc forcibly switching the the the, the cluster uh, label and it's already quite quite nice to see um, that's great yeah if if uh, us east went down and all i noticed was 20 seconds of unresponsive uh, service <laughs> while i switched from another cluster i would be incredibly happy with that uh, 20 seconds up to a minute, up to, you know, five minutes. So. Yeah, they should go sell this to Facebook. They should be using uh, <laughs> KCP. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, that, that Jason, that's in a really interesting point that I think, um, you know, like when we're thinking about like, the meta problem we're trying to get at is not necessarily that everyone all the time would use all the movement, but that mm. movement is just a normal fact of life. And you start putting yourself in a situation where all the problems are around start to become obvious at which point you solve them once and then you don't have to think about them um, you think about the higher level problem later on yeah i mean yeah, it's, I, the, it's the same paradigm shift as when a node goes down right kubernetes meant that means that you don't care when a node goes down because it just automatically works over here now mm -hmm. uh we're just leveling that up to the next level um yeah yeah and i i think as well on a on a different um approach uh, such a demo might resonate also for you know Dev tools or currently workspaces uh, interested people because mainly that has been a problem. Uh, let's say, for example, with Sandbox, you you, um, you have a number of workspaces that we have to spread among various clusters uh, because of you know a load. But uh, what you want is having a single URL to access this without even having the knowledge that they are running on, on distant clusters. So there is the movement that is quite interesting, but the simple fact that you have a single URL that allows you accessing workloads and you know long running workloads that had, that are in fact running in distant clusters th that the end user just isn't aware of that's also quite something that that you know we could not tackle at least on the on the Kodoli workspaces side um, last year for example yeah and i've had similar conversations with with folks in the tecton context of uh, you know, if you run Tecton on top of KCP today, what do you really get out of it? Because uh, you'll still have some, oh, excuse me, uh, you'll still have some downtime while it reschedules everything over there. But uh, especially in Tecton, like as in Code Ready Workspaces, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute of downtime is not going to really bother you. You're going to be happy that you didn't care that that uh, your cluster went down. So uh, the one thing that will be that would make this demo, let's say, <laughs> nearly complete, uh, at least on the quality workspaces side, is um, uh, PVs. Because for now, uh, I'm just working with ephemeral uh, workspaces, and so of course, if you move that, uh, you just lose your work. But if if it would be possible to set up something like you know the project that, that we discussed the last week, that mainly synchronizes PVs through AirSync uh, uh, on the background. 
then that becomes really, really nice. <laughs> yeah, we'll put that in. I, I think like that's probably it. And I was thinking as we were going here and, and talking, like what are some of the phase three um, prototype um, demo goals and definitely PP movement starts getting in there. Um, maybe even, I was trying to think about this too from the perspective of um, what are the things that if you can move them around quickly across different domains or spread them across different domains um, cheaply, it would be easier. Like we've definitely got a Knative or a Tekton job use case in phase three. Maybe there's some things outside of the cube scope that we could also think about, right? Because mm -hmm. if you can schedule, I, I don't know that that maybe falls into phase three, but I'm starting to get into questions of um, like if you could put, yeah, I, I've got some ideas. I don't want to talk about them now just because they're too out there. So we can come back to those later. Um, maybe we should start accruing a phase three list though with ideas that we generate in these. Like um, you know, maybe we should uh, just create the new issue for a phase three uh, prototype and, and start adding notes there mm -hmm. as comments. Yeah, I know Clayton, when we talked about PV movement in uh, uh, earlier, one thing we kept bumping up against was cost, right? Like you can you can rsync mm -hmm. from you know Amazon to Google and back all you want, uh, and it will be great when your cluster goes down and you automatically move over there. But in the meantime, you're going to get like tens of thousands of dollars worth of usage uh, copying all of this stuff back and forth. So I don't know how to surface that. I don't know how like technically it is it is relatively easy to move objects back and forth you know technically that's that's you know only a hard problem the extra hard problem is going to be putting cost controls in place or having some way to even signal you know this is the cost in in general terms of the of keeping these two things in sync um, yeah it, and this gets a little bit into like conditions um and the idea that objects have costs associated with them we really haven't dealt with movement costs like uh, uh, cube uh, preemption has some of the basic models of effectively the cost to preempt mm -hmm. and some of movement movement kind of looks like preemption if you squint hard enough. Um, but yeah, surfacing that and summarizing it, uh, I would agree anything that's not free, you don't do by default unless, I mean, <laughs> Creating service load balancers to run a cube cluster or creating a service load balancer on our cluster is also not free, as anyone who's um, created a bunch on their AWS account has ever found. Mm -hmm. So maybe one of the things would be um, we just need to think about an example of a pattern where we materialize the cost that somebody else can take into account, whether it's a human or a mm -hmm. machine. Um, honestly, yeah. with PVs, like a status field on a PV that tells you how much data there is is a little weird. Um, usage doesn't change all that frequently, but at the, at some level, you know, if you've asked for a hundred gigabyte PV, you don't really care whether it's at 91 or 92 gigs, um, or you definitely don't care if it's at 91 gigs, 383 megs, 563K. Mm -hmm. So there's a precision mm -hmm. summary that could be proportional to size in such that Maybe this is just a way, a fancy way of saying that PV usage is representing some factor that we're just not taking into account, whether it's one like gravity um, or latency. Like we haven't talked about speed of light modeling and there's plenty of prior art there, but um, some of I, the assumptions of a cube definitely depend on homogeneity within the cluster and yeah. close proximity. We're breaking both of those and then we need to model them, absolutely. Uh, I think I missed. I think I missed how uh, reporting volume usage relates to moving things. Uh, the the heft of a PV is huh. roughly proportional to the cost to move it. The yeah, different yeah. types of movement and where you move it to would factor into that. But in theory, right. it's a little bit like speed of light and latency. Like the cost to go down a pipe between two physical clusters is roughly proportional to speed of light bandwidth and cost yeah um maybe there's a fundamental like weight times cost times movement i mean certainly like ingress routing right um uh if you gain three milliseconds of latency moving someone across or 30 milliseconds of latency moving someone from cluster a to b i don't know that we want to be in that business necessarily 
But there's always the question of, um, is there something that everybody has to struggle with that if you pull out the commonality is simple enough that everybody can just use it? That's another cubism, right? Um, yeah, that, I guess, so, so uh, the missing link in my head was, if somebody's going to enable copy that, you know, make sure this this PV is also available in these in this cluster as a backup, they would want before they turn that on, they would want to see how much how much data is in there, which roughly uh, corresponds to how much cost it would be to move it there and back. It, right. And roughly, if you're doing active passive replication, there's two things, which is how far you are you behind in time and how far are you behind in bytes, mm -hmm. whatever those translate mm -hmm. to in your domain model is almost irrelevant. Um, so something we can come, I, I think it's a phase three discussion, even if we maybe don't prototype it in phase three. Phase three might be enough to, the prototype might be enough to trigger the problem that we then say, man, we really should have a concept that, you know, brings into the distinct, brings into clarity uh, spread decisions across clusters and intra cluster latency and intra cluster bandwidth and intra cluster cost. Cube doesn't model within AZ or across AZ costs, but they're there. Um, you know, maybe there's some some analogs that we could we look at. Like we have talked about, we're trying to help you model resiliency and failure domains with these chunks of homogenous cap capability. Maybe workplace capacity pool, which is what we're talking about, is like the underlying object for a location is really just a failure domain. <laughs> maybe that's what we should call it. Yeah, I'm also trying to think of a, 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 a test for that phase three thing. So so going back to a couple points ago was that right now, rescheduling basically only happens or is only really planned to happen right now when a cluster disappears, when a cluster dies or is unavailable. Uh, and that's like a reschedule me signal of, uh, of wait 100, where you cannot be here, you must leave. Uh, and what we want is for there to be reschedule signals of weights between zero and 100, where you could say, you know, Amazon raised their prices, you should move. Or, uh, you know, this, this is uh, acting slower than normal. You should move, but not urgently. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the cost of it, this being here has increased and might take you over a threshold that you care about and might trigger a move. I'm trying to think of simpler cases that we could, simpler yeah. than detecting latency and simpler than detecting cost increases or 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 the other, the, the real case is like Amazon lowered prices and now is the cheapest place to run this. We should move <laughs> everything there. Um, yeah, or Cloudflare, Cloudflare breaks all paradigms related to bandwidth cost and suddenly yeah. everything outside of a, a tier one cloud becomes attractive because yeah. they don't charge usurious egress fees or um, so there so is an I think of a case that's that's simpler than detecting latency, which is pretty hard and detecting cost and, and having some model of actual like, you know, dollar cost. Is so, there something we could do for a test? I mean, we could just say like, you know, it cluster West uh, pricing costs now equals $1,000 a second and watch your your deployment move away because, you know, too rich for my blood or whatever. Yeah, costs don't change all that often. I mean, it, maybe like I think this is a this is a use a fundamental use case problem of why does someone what what does someone expect or want out of their application decisions? Like, what's the fundamental question we're trying to talk about? And we're kind of circling around a couple. Um, one of them is you know treat individual failure domains, model individual failure domains in a way that allows you to mostly ignore them or to think about them as fungible. Um, which is not the case today for Cube. It's not the case today for cloud regions. It's not the case for clouds. It's not the case for private clouds or on-premise data centers. Um, another one, I mean, and, and Jason, I think you were kind of circling around it is like modeling the cost of resiliency or trade-offs, I think could be something important or something that they're, I don't know if we can reduce it that trivially, but it's worth, asking, it's worth, I think, investigating, which would be how much does active active cost me? And what is, what do we mean by cost? It could be price, it could be latency, it could be user experience, it could be um, opportunity cost, right? Running something active active means running twice as much, which means you're 
running less. Um, I don't know that like, Ultimately, we've said a couple things like we want to expose the true costs in a way that makes them um, you can plan around them. We want to expose resiliency so you can plan for it, right? If your dependency is only running in U.S. East uh, Zone 1, there's zero purpose in running it outside of that. Um, or there's, there's zero value uh, making it globally redundant. So we're trying to articulate um, how do you make trade? How do you make the the right trade offs between failure domains for workload, and maybe today that's cube workloads, but maybe in the future that's other types of infrastructure, um, like uh, ar arguably most software runs most places, um, you know, through either containers or VMs or functions. Um, what can we do to enable? making those trade-offs really clear like someone just gives you a bunch of choices and you make the right choice and if you don't make if you don't make a choice you get a reasonable default and then you can easily transition from the reasonable default to an increasingly valuable set of trade-offs for <laughs> resiliency or for redundancy or for separation are you talking about upgrading a function to a container to a VM as part of that, or is that seems... maybe the other way? Around. It could be the other way around. Um, sure. Certainly, a lot of people are transitioning from like if you if you watch the VM migration stories, people move from traditional workloads and VMs to containers. Sometimes they go straight to functions. When you move to a function, you're also typically taking advantage of new capabilities um, like object storage or uh, you know serverless DBs um, or DBs databases accessed as an operational you know, from a serverless from the end user's perspective. Uh, maybe there's some other trade-offs there that we could talk about, like going from, you know, from mean time to recovery is your resiliency strategy, which is the cube default for a replica set, um, which is how quickly can cube detect the nodes failed and create a copy of it. Then there's active active or active passive depending on the use case then there's sharded um most people move up data stores like everything today you have to plan for this ahead of time which is great there's an argument like is there a space for us in the app ecosystem to help make those trade-offs be trivial like maybe in the future you define your function and you don't actually care which serverless infrastructure runs on you're if you have security domains like an AWS account or a GCP project, those are parts of the factor of who can access what, but generally your services and your applications are composed of multiple of those components. So you're already kind of assuming someone sets those up securely. Um, kind of what we're talking about is stitching together that, that graph of all the connected components and trying to be a, an assister for that. So, um, yeah. I, I, Maybe prototype three needs it needs to have something I think along these lines. Um, it could be the resiliency trade off. It could be the cost trade off. It could be the, you know, we need to do some more source searching and and uh, and ask what problems are people facing that this abstraction or what new abstractions would help people bypass those problems. Like Tecton, like the easy one is like Tecton yeah. K Native and Code Ready. We've already identified three very concrete use cases, which is I really just don't want to care about the cluster. I want batch to work. I want uh, a stateful hosted thing to work. And I, want, uh, I want to be able to run functions close to where the data is. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, I think the evolution from phase, so phase two is uh, just be able to move when the cluster dies, right? Like like actually watch watch things pick up and move when the cluster underneath it completely dies. Mm -hmm. The diff to phase three could just be in addition to volume stuff, which I think. Ignoring volume stuff for now, uh, have it take into account some uh, some quantitative value and say like I am willing to put up with three units of stress, whether that's cost or latency or something. Mm -hmm. Three three you know stress bucks, uh, and so uh, then assign a value to the cost of it, and then show you know the, the I've lowered the cost I've I've ten x the cost of this cluster or point ten x point one x the cost of this cluster and watch it you know move not because the clusters are down but because the clusters are cheaper or more expensive it, or 
or you, late I, think, I think you kind of hit it on the head, Jason. Like it's um, the big lie with Kubernetes, um, which isn't a lie. It was well, don't actually, tell everyone. I know. It was, we explicitly <laughs> stated, I remember um, talking to Brendan, you know, very early. He's like, a cube cluster should only ever be one uh, failure zone. And he's right because a lot of the assumptions in clusters make that. But the things that gave us a lot is to say, okay, let's take failure zones out of the picture. So demo two or prototype two is saying, um, how do we make the cluster, which is the itself the thing that provides that, not a failure, um, or we're not faded with the cluster. And then the second step is, is there the next example of either assigning a cost or assigning a trade-off so that you're not faded to other types of problems uh, or faded to other failure yeah. domains? I think, uh, and I think that- Sure, dependencies, et cetera. I think the phase three will also be the smallest possible like toe into the, huge arena of these cost evaluations, right? Like we can, step one is is be able to report these things to people. Step two is allow people to make policies based on the, the data we give them. And then to automate it is after that, right? So, well, so and, we might just and, say like, alert, your thing just got more expensive. Please click this button to, to save money. And then eventually and we'll automate that for you. It's a great point, like, cause Cube, even though Cube has now grown some of the take resources into account throughout the life cycle of a cluster. It doesn't really, right? Like most distributions don't turn on the scheduler by default. Um, mm -hmm. Most clusters don't do automatic draining. Uh, you know, GCP finally got close. GCP has um, support for ephemeral um, nodes, but then there's still like a bunch of problems with it that we're kind of working through upstream on the life cycle of what does it mean when a when a node fails before it has a chance to check in who's responsible for cleaning up that life cycle so we're kind of adding the the closure of the loop even 7 years into cube and so 8 years um is it 8 years already it's getting close uh the closure of the loop on resource may just never happen um doesn't mean that you know the basic scheduling model isn't useful of cpu and requests because most stuff updates faster than it changes resource requirements in the vast majority of the the cube fleet the magic auto scaling is something that's like a one percent kind of problem um, whereas yeah. standardizing all your deployments and being able to to take advantage of that if you want it is a 99 percent problem yeah there's another there's another uh scheduling input case that i think we also could address in phase three, which is uh, available resources. So right now, if a cluster mm -hmm. is available, but with no, you know, the API server is accessible, but there are no available resources to schedule anything, mm -hmm. KCP and even the, like the namespace scheduler will gladly put stuff there that will never actually schedule. Um, right. So we need some some pushback from the cluster that says like, I'm here and I might and I'm not gone forever, but uh, please don't give me more work right now. Um, so will someone take drafting some of these into prototype three issue? Yeah, and I'll, just suggest some of these. Yeah, uh, I will do that uh, in these notes, and then I'll move it to an issue as we work on that. Um, David, you also had uh, uh, sinking corner cases. Uh, you wanted to talk um, about. yeah, yeah, maybe just there was uh, <clears throat> one point in the previous bullet uh, discussion about the main challenge: uh, status syncing and status ownership. You you just mentioned it, um, you Akim, uh, previously. Maybe you you want to 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 give more insights. Oh, go, go ahead, David. Go ahead. Um, yeah, mainly. Um, in the case uh, of uh, where it made sense for for the Kali workspaces or well, workspaces, um, we mainly just um, create have to create an ingress on only one cluster because there is it's not a case where we want you know load balancing or any stuff like that. We just want to have uh, one cluster assigned to uh, the workspace living on only one cluster, and so mainly. Um, with the current way the sinker and all the overall design is is existing, we had to um, still create a, a derived ingress from the main ingress that is created by the, the workspace controller. Um, and on this derived ingress then set the cluster label so that 
finally, when it is synced back uh, from um, uh, KCP, from the physical cluster, you get in the ingress status the host name or the IP uh, that was set by the physical cluster. And then so from this... Is, this is carrying over stuff that's in gateway or OpenShift routes or HTTP route. The status, the status field? Yes, exactly. and mainly the problem that we, we saw is uh, it's quite painful uh, to create um, <clears throat> derived objects because um, this mainly just um, was messing with the uh, initial, you know, external con uh, dev workspace controller, which mainly just did not expect a second uh, ingress. And on the other hand, we wanted to maybe just uh, set the cluster uh, label on the main ingress. But then you have a problem of ownership of the status because uh, the status will be set back by the sinker as being the one set by the underlying physical cluster. But then from this status, that is mainly the, um, the status as viewed by the physical cluster layer. From this status, you want uh, uh, the KCP ingress controller to derive, uh, you know, a sort of abstract status, the final status, which mainly will be the host uh, that points to to the Envoy proxy. So mainly we have, in fact, two distinct status in the same, um, let's say, abstract uh, resource, which is the ingress that was created by the, consu the consumer um, controller, which is the Dev Workspace controller, you have two levels of status, the one that is set by the physical cluster and the one that is finally set by the overall KCP machinery based on the status of the physical cluster so to be seen well, by external consumers. I don't know if I'm clear. Jason, Jason, correct me if I'm misremembering, but when we were talking about this and the stepping through the app model stuff, we were talking about bringing that status specifically up to something outside of the existing status field because of this challenge. Um, yeah, I, I don't, we didn't come we up with a magic about, solution for it, but we just, we brought it yeah. up via the annotation. Yeah, I think we, roughly speaking, just stuffed it in the annotation as the only other place to put this stuff. And it was a, it was that's a coordination point between sinkers though. That was, yeah, when exactly. we described it, we were describing it between sinker one needs to convey information that may, may not be relevant to the end user so that sinker two would have that same information available for, I think we talked about it in terms of like volume move or something like which, which snapshot on cluster one. We talked about it as a communication channel for sinkers, mm -hmm. not as a communication yeah. channel for end users though. I think, yeah, it, I think I, it could be both though, right? Like I don't wanna, I, I think anything a sinker wants to say to another sinker should also be assumed to be visible to the end user or of use to the end user. You, you think it should be visible by the end user? Because I mean, that to me, that mainly relates to to, uh, to what we discussed last week. Um, typically, if even if you add an annotation on the on the initial object that was created by the consumer uh, controller, the dev workspace controller, typically this will you know this might create a new event in the in the consumer controller because you you change the object. I mean, in in a context that is also that is initially owned by the consumer controller. Uh, and so obviously this might not uh, be harmful for the controller if it does nothing when, when an annotation change. But I mean, theoretically, you just change the flow uh, of, of the consumer controller, of the external controller. And it seems to quite, you know, a source of, it will be a source of problem. I mean, it seems to me that everything that is just between the physical cluster, the sinker, and KCP should just not be seen by by um, external uh, uh, mm. controllers. It should well, just, just be encapsulated. But even in the even in the ingress case, um, you know, certainly like you know, every time I've dealt mm -hmm. with large scale load balancing setups, having look C names that point to specific subsets of the workload has been valuable, even if it's you know, even if you have like a, a global load balancer or a load balancer across multiple chunks of the workload, you know, you might have two C names, one for one, one for one zone, one for another. 
and your load balancer is targeting what's under those C names, but it's not re necessarily referencing the C names directly. Uh, so I could see there being scenarios where you might be interested in the C name of the underlying ingress mm. in each chunk. I, I don't think that's the most important thing. I mean, it could point to a modeling problem. Um, you know, there's an assumption like uh, OpenShift routes supported multiplicity of status. Does gateway mm. assume there's one or does it support multiple? Stat, multiple possible names that you could be exposed under or multiple possible ingress controllers that could expose you. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, to be fair, I'm more uh, concerned about, you know, the transparency of the whole, you know, uh, uh, pattern and multi-cluster pattern, transparent multi-cluster pattern. I mean that if, if we mainly change the, the, the object in a way that it is visible uh, for internal purposes in, in a way that is visible from outside. It seems that this somehow breaks the transparency because this might um, uh, conflict with the expectations uh, of of the the, uh, the external uh, controller that is not aware uh, that yeah, I mean, KCP. Fundamentally, an ingress can have multiple names, some of which are like today mm -hmm. zero ingress exposes zero names. Um, and what I, was, what I was getting before, like OpenShift routes, you could have n names, zero to n names. Uh, if gateway is zero to one, if HTTP route and contour is zero to one, those are kind of like, that's almost a modeling question, which is mm. if you can have an ingress with multiple names, is the current shape of the API appropriate for representing that? And what do you, and this is basically what you're asking, what do you do when the modeling of a, a resource you would like to use transparently is not actually transparent. Yeah. Um, and that might be things like, I mean, at some level, the sinker, nothing about the sinker necessarily says that the schema at the high level has to be the same as the low level. Although ideally the deviation is small, right? Like we, we plan for some level of deviation between high level representation and low level, you know, 1% mm -hmm. to 5%. Is ingress something where a five percent deviation we could make it make sense to a user and not violate those? You know, user comes in, they create an ingress, the outcome that they see is what they expect. So that kind of gets into your like what like deriving a, an ingress, um, changing what the the mapping is. Um. And could it make sense to have something quite generic uh, for this um, with something like you know? Um, an additional sub resource that we expose only to KCP components, the sinker mm. of, of the stuff, and That's... that allow you know storing back the status as seen by the as sent back by the physical cluster, but that would not be seen by normal clients as the status, and then the sink the the some other controller like the KCP ingress controller, which is also part of the overall KCP machinery, um, would be able to just do whatever it wants with this internal status to finally set the, the status that, that external clients will see. I mean, it could be, and this is an open question, it could actually be that the ingress controller is an example of where the ingress controller might point at the control plane, but it might also look at individual clusters or have a component that's on individual clusters as well. And so it's not actually the sinker's responsibility to make that transformation. Mm -hmm. It's something specific to that. We haven't really talked about that. So uh, as part of, so a couple of folks were asking like what topologies for controllers and patterns. And like, since you kind of have the high level control plane as source of truth, and then you want to bring low level down and have it be resilient, right? You want your sub control planes, whether those are clusters or more KCP instances, or maybe in the in the for, further future, something that runs on a node that looks a little bit like a halfway mix between the kubelet and KCP. You're trying to bring down a representation of what the desired state is, track locally so that you're resilient, and then summarize that back up. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe ingress is the first place where we're pushing ourselves to ask the question, does the pattern for the sinker hold for ingress? If it doesn't, mm -hmm. what would be our approach? And we should, we should, we should work through the example and say like, okay, 
um, these are the fields we have to copy back. What would an end user expect? What would be the most resilient? And what mm -hmm. would require the fewest number of deviations from the pattern? Maybe that's our yeah. rubric for what, what a good model is. Yeah. yeah. So I remember having the conversation about modifying types and stuffing other information, like stuffing KCP information into them, adding fields or adding sub resources. And mm. I thought we all decided that was madness and we could do it, right? <laughs> like we can, we can, we can modify the type however we want. We can do whatever we want with it, but it would require mm. too much it's not technically difficult. It's like difficult for developers to get to that information, mm -hmm. including us, uh, because if you add a field to something and it's not in the go type, then, you know, it's, it's gone for you. Uh, also, you're polluting the API space that you don't own. So the, the big one is if you add yeah. a field and then something in the underlying object adds it later, uh, that's kind of an argument for, we could call it like we could call it KCP status or you know something that yeah. is unique enough. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure someone's not going to come for it, but uh, that doesn't seem as hard as the the like practical issue of having to modify each type and each Go struct to be able to. And, and why like not? We... Sorry. Oh, and why not having some sort of virtual resource that would mainly just be available from the KCP side, and you know a virtual resource. Um, location status that is related that is that points to or is related to 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 any resource existing at the kcp layer and that defines the status but then it's just a virtual resource that means that in kcp we just inter intercepts that and store um the status sent back from the physical cluster in some way i i, I have no idea here <laughs> so that that's an interesting point david because like what we're effectively saying is um there is a set of data that is owned by the sinker that multiple sinkers may need to coordinate on. So what we were mostly talking yeah. about in the other, in the stepping through the application model doc was when sinkers needed to coordinate where they roughly have the same algorithm. Um, and that was mostly around transactional movement of ownership, like A hands off to B. We just wrote down an example of without a central coordinator, sinker could mm. say, sinker is a little bit like a node, it's saying, I'm done with this pod, therefore mm -hmm. somebody else can take over mm -hmm. life. Like I've handed off life cycle responsibility in a transactional way. And then in our case, Sinker 2 picks it up in um, the cube case. When a node goes into terminal state, um, technically like the pod uh, garbage collection controller takes over ownership. And at that point, like it's a time space. So like you're handing off ownership. This is a different problem almost, which is you are summarizing information from a sinker or a part of a, a program running with the sinker, another controller loop or an adapter or strategy or whatever that mm. needs some higher level coordination and summary because it's part of a higher level application model. I think what we should probably do is use this as a working example and write, walk through the options in detail and talk about what the trade-offs are because this will form one of the patterns, which is it's broader than a sinker pattern. It's what happens when you need to coordinate across yeah. multiple instances mm -hmm. of the sinker because the problem has a higher level representation. Mm. So if, if David, I mean, that's a, you and Joachim and I can help and you know, Jason, if he wants to jump in and we can go through some of the same, we can work through some of the same flow we were using with the networking stuff as ways of driving the example out and say, Here's our five options. Here's the ones that suck. Here's the ones we considered. Here's the ones that, um, here's the best possible option. And then we can contrast it to what we were talking about for when the sinker, when a controller on each distributed shard wants to hand off ownership, which is just a different problem. Yeah, I think I think this this type of problem is going to exist for every resource, roughly. Like like yeah, yeah. for a split deployment, we want to be able to say this many replicas are ready over here and this many are ready over here. We need to stuff that information somewhere, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and once this... again, maybe you sorry. And once but... again, maybe you don't want to to have those derived de deployments, split deployments, visible from from outside. Yeah. I mean, uh, this, this is effectively. From... Go ahead. This is effectively where Federation V1 really struggled, which was it's hard to do this. We have more tools. I think we said this in one of the earlier meetings. Like we have more tools at our disposal. The default option 
should be to not make it visible to the end user unless we have yeah. to probably, uh, because I think that's one of the sources of complexity in KubeFed where KubeFed found itself having to change the definition of an object. We're trying not mm. to change the definition of fields. Um, you know, in terms of like the why why will this succeed where KubeFed struggled would be um, don't try to change the definition of the meaning of a field. Uh, yeah. Don't necessarily try to add additional fields or you know only do it as a last resort, but think about what you would need to allow another controller to do the effective summarization um, that would be compatible. So I completely agree about not changing the definition of a field or, or the semantic like mm -hmm. data because that seems bad. Uh, I want I do want to push back on hiding things from the user by default. Like I think if I'm a user who creates a deployment or an ingress and it gets split across two clusters, there is no reason I shouldn't be able to figure out. Like don't don't uh, don't put that in the status where where I would just want to look at it like it's a regular single cluster uh, deployment. But I also don't want to have to ask super nicely or go through some side door to be able to get like, sure. be ready I, I was mostly thinking, A versus cluster B. I think that's I mean, a like, level, core fundamental issue that I want to avoid for any maybe, maybe it would be effectively summarize the outcome and keep the outcomes simple and easy to understand, right? That's a good rule of right. design, a no matter what. In, aggregating and summarizing in that deployment status, it, absolutely, right? I want to use yeah. the same dashboards, the same CLIs, the same everything to see that 10 of my 20 replicas are ready. But then when I want to go see that how many are over here and how many here, I don't want to have to. Well, but I, I, maybe maybe that's what I was actually saying is um, yeah. maybe how many are over here and how many are over there is actually the wrong problem in some cases and I, we would have to work through each example but like just for deployment because, it might be maybe split types of deployments with different replicas is the wrong problem to solve with a single deployment object because there's nothing that prevents you from creating two deployment objects setting their scales individually and then setting a <laughs> uh an affinity rule that prevents them from being scheduled on the same capacity pool like that may be a more effective mechanism or introducing a new object uh, like because again at the end of the day right. if we do our jobs right types become more fungible people should feel like they can use the right tool for the job we're going for ubiquity of the patterns right cube patterns should be ubiquitous but there's plenty of patterns cube doesn't solve like a sharded deployment or a globally distributed deployment getting someone to a point where they're like cool I see the limitations now I'll go use the Karmada globally distributed deployment object which does let me do all this craziness um, because I get this benefit. Maybe that's kind of what, that's just what I meant is like, um, mm -hmm. use the friction that we see as guidance to say, if we can't stick within the bounds, um, go only a little bit outside the bounds, stop, and then help someone get to that better option. Um, if we can imagine what the better option is, like we wanna be able to compose types more effectively. Like uh, part of the goal is, I can take a service and deployment and compose that with service dependencies across globally distributed use cases and get the right outcome. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to compose a SaaS service or a Lambda with a you know cube native app running on a, an AWS zone composed with a Kafka topic running across, you know, a Kafka ingress topic that's fed across like three geographic regions what would that composition need? And so like today you could probably argue composing deployments and other types of deployments is too hard. If we fix that, or we make it so that you can use a deployment or a global deployment or a global sharded deployment just as easily, you know, from Tekton or from um, mm -hmm. you know, tools, maybe we've, maybe we've succeeded by going around the problem and saying, well, composability is the real goal. Yeah, I think I would, I think it would be, said if we at the end of this required users to create two deployments with anti-affinity in order to get a split deployment but if if well and this is the thing though is like um how many what percentage of all deployments created in all cube clusters would be candidates for a mixed split versus an even split and so like if you say if you can do even split transparently then effectively what you've done is you said, well, I've solved 90% only need one, 9% will be fine with even and 1% want to, hey, 1%, you have a pattern that can work for you. Um, 
we're just not focused on anything other than 99% of workloads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I think maybe there's a, a, a confusion there too, which is I thought we decided when you, the prototype doesn't do this, but we decided that deployment splitting would actually be, if you ask for five replicas, we'll put five over here and five over here. And that that is easier to reconcile, no pun intended, easier to reconcile with uh, auto scaling. Uh, uh, right. But Right, that's even splitting. But even auto scaling would be like if you've got two different auto scalers, uh, is that too? Uh, maybe let me take a step back. Even does HPA summarize status effectively? What other things would summarize? You know, HPA. There's always going to be a problem that mapping one to n, it doesn't work in cube very well, right? Like we, we've already talked about adding index jobs because of problems like that. Um, Stateful set is adding fields that. Stable set has we've discussed adding sub fields that break up the rules. If we can get those rules in the base types, that means that the use case is amenable to it, right? Like would someone who's using a deployment today on a single cube cluster who's trying to do canaries actually prefer to have a deployment strategy that uh, ends up creating a replica set of canaries and, and drive it? Like that's hard to do through cube today. It's not extensible. But there's the argument, there's the counter argument, which would be like, well, if you really want to go fix it, if that's really the problem, go switch it. Conversely, if um, like one of the interesting things we're talking about, and I think Jason, this is like the, the key point is it's still too hard for someone to propagate new cube types across a wide range of use cases because there's no center of gravity. One of the things we're trying to do is create that like most people's KCP could do this if all you had to do to add a new global deployment type was you know, just fire up this simple integration against your KCP server and you got magic geo distributed deployments, which can compose nicely. There might be a lot of people who switch to it who would be perfectly happy to use that instead of raw deployment. Um, the yeah. switch cost just has to be low. Um, and that means keeping the concepts close enough, but they don't necessarily have to even be identical. Right, that sort of, uh, th that has, Reminds me of hints of Knative, where like Knative yep, was like, we're just going to go solve these other deployment issues, and all you have to do is rename this to this, and now you get Knative. Yep. I, I think the Knative <laughs> duct typing pattern and the comp like composition duct typing and some of the things we've talked about, like um, making it easy to switch from type to type or implementation to implementation. If we can, that is maybe that's maybe not part of prototype three, or maybe it is. Maybe there's just two tracks in prototype three, which is. Um, we're trying to help people bring together a large set of APIs. What would be the first example? And the first example might just be a more advanced case of uh, what happens when a cube primitive that makes sense in a single cluster no longer makes sense in an existing cluster. Maybe ingress isn't the best option for it, but maybe there's a global ingress object. Um, maybe maybe we, we work through this use case and find out that maybe we don't want to do magic with ingress. Um, uh, right. That's, that's, uh, that's yet another fire escape is yes. if we can't change ingress, we just say, okay, in order to get ingress globally, you search and replace ingress for global ingress. And now you, now we do different <laughs> stuff. And, yeah. and now we completely control the type and, you know, we, we can do whatever we want and you. That's just not, not, not really transparent anymore. <laughs> but, well, and, and, but you know, all transparency is we've got the 95% rule for a reason. Yeah which is mm. perfection is not our goal, value and utilization <laughs> sure. is, right? So yeah. I, I do want to try as much as possible for transparency. So we it would not be the first thing to be like, create a new type. But so uh, mm. Joaquin, uh, David, you y'all feel like you could work through this and then maybe I can, I can give you an example of kind of the style we were using for the, Joaquin, you guys have both seen the, the stepping through the application doc, if we can create an example of that for how do we coordinate and draw up the problems and the different approaches. Mm. Yeah. Um, so we only have five minutes left, uh, but I just lost it. What was I going to talk about? Um, uh, oh, the the it, uh, having to require like opt in for global deployment would also disrupt some of the controller use cases we're talking about, where we want to say like when you install Tecton on KCP, it will detect it's a controller. It will take your regular deployment. This is like goes to David's transparency point. Like, if we get a deployment object and all we know how to do is global deployments, what do we upgrade them mm. transparently? Like, do we get transparency back by just upgrading them 
deleting your deployment, mm -hmm. creating a global deployment instead, and mm -hmm. going from there. I don't know. I think I think it's a an, an option worth talking about, but not. I don't think. I hope it's not the way that we do this because it's a bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, because th th then we try to make this the thing simpler on one side, but it becomes more. It become more complicated on the other side. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, KubeCon is next week. I think we still plan. Do we still plan to have a KCP meeting next week, or would we like to skip? Um, I will be at KubeCon. If there's anybody who will also be at KubeCon on this or listening to this, um, you know, feel free to, to reach out by the KCB channels. We might, I might actually suggest we, if there are people who are in person, um, I may do something informal. Um, we don't have any lightning talks planned. Um, I planned oh. to do hallway track and go around and talk to people who have interesting use cases who've talked to me. So um, I may send, I'll send something out to the KCB dev list about, uh, uh, you know, come find me at KubeCon, or um, we'll sort of try to find a meetup if anyone's interested in chatting about different use cases and yeah. and things that we may not be focused on, but people would be interested in mm. discussing outside of this. Yeah, I will be there Wednesday to Friday, and I'm giving a talk Thursday. So, okay. uh, also, if anyone is hearing this and wants to grab me, you have Wednesday to Friday. Um, I will, for now, I guess, assume we are going to have a KCP meeting next week, although I might cancel it because, uh, oh my god, KubeCon uh, uh, mm -hmm. preparation and stress and crazy. So yeah, well, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and skip next week. And any Perfect. any issues people want to bring up can bring up other mailing lists yeah. or yeah. in Slack chat. Cool. we Will do. Uh, all right. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to sneak in before the wire? All right. On that note. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Have a good week or two weeks. Bye. Bye. Bye.